Hi, everyone. Right. <laughs> no worries. Welcome to the third webinar in the LSNTAP Summer Self-Help Series. In this webinar today, we are going to hear from three representatives of three organizations that have taken their website um, to a, a second iteration, or in some cases, a third iteration. Um, and so they're going to be talking about the process of doing that, that redesign, overhaul, relaunch, um, and some of the important lessons that they have learned along the way. We have uh, Gwen Daniels from Illinois Legal Aid Online, Emily Good from Law Help MN in Minnesota, and Daniel Ettinger from the Northwest Justice Project in Washington State. So we are going to start with each of them um, giving a, a, a sort of overview of, um, of what their transition process was like, um, when it happened, uh, or what stage they're in now. And then um, I have a series of questions that I'll ask them to, to have a conversation. But if you have questions along the way, you should also feel free to uh, put those in the chat or raise your hand, and uh, we will let you ask them live. Um, we do ask that everyone mute themselves um, unless they are um, asking a question and that will help keep down the background noise. So Gwen, why don't you start us off with telling us a little bit about Aleo's transformation? Yeah. Um, I'm Gwen Daniels. I'm the deputy director at Illinois Legal Aid Online. Um, we have been around for 21 21 years. Our first website went live in 2002 and has since gone through, a, I would say, about five major overhauls. Um, the first one in 2005. Then again, when we launched the online triage and intake system in 2013, we had a complete rebuild uh, between 2014 and 2016 to move off of Cold Fusion and moving into Drupal 7. Um, that was probably our most expensive and most painful. Um, redesign. Um, and in 2019 to 2020, we did another um, redesign going from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. And now we are on, on Drupal 9, and that was a fairly seamless um, upgrade. Great. Thank you. Uh, Emily. I'm Emily Good. I'm a project manager at um, Legal Services State Support Minnesota, and we run a bunch of the websites statewide, but the big one is lawhelpmn.org. And our site originally launched in 2005 as part of the Pro Bono Net Law Help Sites platform, and we were on that platform up until we did a redesign of our site that started in 2018, um, well, late 2017, really, um, but mostly happened in 2018. And then we launched a new site in 2019. And we, during that process, moved to, um, from the Law Help platform over to Drupal. And there were a couple of factors that made us decide to make that transition. One of them was wanting greater control over how we put content up and what um, sort of editorial control over how the site looked. Another really big piece was, as a lot of folks um, were sort of pushed towards triage, having a more interactive feature to help clients identify their legal issue and match them with resources and referrals, and wanting our online intake um, to the different programs, legal service programs that we work with to flow more seamlessly out of the law help, um, out of our law help site. And so that was sort of what motivated us to decide to work um, and move over to a Drupal platform. And since then, we've um, made a number of iterations in the site. We haven't done another massive overhaul, although we continue to make tweaks and changes. And um, all of the programs that we work with, for example, are now on legal server. And so our online intake integration um, matches up with legal server in a way that it didn't when we did that initial move over to online intake. And that's been one of the great things about um, the site that we're on now is that we just have a lot of nimbleness to continue to make those changes and developments as things happen. Um, and then talk more about kind of specifically what those would look like, but that's where we are at. Great, thank you so much. And Daniel. Yeah, um, I always think 
well, I, visual visual aids help me a lot in learning. <laughs> and so I'm going to share my screen to show sort of, let me know when you can see it. We can see it. OK, do you see the PowerPoint slide? Yep, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. OK, so this is the history of WashingtonLawHelp.org. So it started in 1998, and we had a, a, a quote in the sort of script <laughs> from Judge Learned Hand. It was basically a combination with nwjustice.org, I think. This is before my time. <laughs> At, but very text heavy. And but it was it was that's the first attempt to present legal information in sort of plain language. And it's kind of like a digital brochure rack. And the 2.0 site launched, I, I believe this is the Pro Bono Net platform in 2006. And you, we, we since did a redesign, we call it 3.0 in 2016. And this slide is actually from a presentation that I gave last fall. So it's a little outdated because we're honestly on, I guess what I'd call 3.5. That, and you can see it looks a little different. We got a refresh. The Pro Bono Net platform rolled out a, a refresh look. We got a new logo. I like this new, more streamlined logo. And uh, you can see it's, it looks kind of the same, but it it's, feels a little more um, 2020s type style. And, but you, I have 4.0 here because we applied for a technology initiative grant from LSE in 2019 to redesign our site, make it more accessible, easier to navigate, mobile first. And we are right in the middle of that project. So we started last year we did a massive inventory. Oh, I should show you this too, it might be interesting. This is another history. We were getting about a quarter, 250,000 visitors when we first launched and we like, we now have about 2 million people visit the site a year. Um, and and a, this is like pandemic era, but a, a huge increase during the pandemic. And we started doing webinars and a lot of other things. Um, and the, the laws in Washington for tenants changed in a big way last year. There's now a right to an attorney in eviction proceedings for people with low incomes. And we have just cause eviction, it's statewide. So that meant we had to do a huge amount of uh, public legal education. So we created dozens of new fact sheets and infographics and videos and webinars. And we've been prioritizing translations into 16 different languages. So it's a lot of just, we've just been making many, many new things. Um, part of the redesign project last year, we started with a lot of usability testing. So we set up this website improvement program and offered people a $20 gift card if they would spend an hour with us, share their screen, give them a hypothetical. We actually did comparative analysis with all of your wonderful sites too. We really admire Law Help Minnesota, Illinois Legal Aid Online, Michigan Legal Help. And we did listening sessions with law librarians because we, we know that Law librarians, social workers, volunteer lawyer programs, they all rely on WashingtonLawHelp.org in, in helping people. So it's not just people who aren't lawyers, it's people helping people who aren't lawyers. And we, we you all, some of you may know that there was a, an outage <laughs> of the Pro Bono Net platform in March. Um, it basically took our website down. There was some security incident at the Pro Bono Net side. So our website went down for a week and our interactive interviews and our forms went down for about a month. And we sent out surveys to people like, how is this affecting you? And we got a lot of, a lot of, please put the website back up. <laughs> we need it. We need it now. <laughs> like, what are you doing? So um, that's a little summary of Washington Law Help. I'll, I'll just say sometimes this is this may be illustrative of the, the mass of the site because we hadn't really ever done a huge inventory of what, what all do we have here? We keep adding things, we keep adding things over the years, but we need to step back and see like, well, are people actually clicking on this? So the inventory we started last year was in a spreadsheet that is here. And 
you can see some of the resources get hit thousands of times, tens of thousands of times, or there's a lot of stuff that doesn't get hit, but there's over like 1400 items here. Some of them are external links, some of them are fact sheets. We, and we're, we're trying to do the content management system upgrade. And that's a big part of why we wanted to redesign the site is because it's for, it's just it's such amount of material that we don't even know what we all have. And we know a lot more than we did, but um, we've since started using a, pro, a, a project management program called Smartsheet. And so we sent things over here, but we can now do manage our workflow a little better, but we're hoping to improve that process too when we select a vendor, a web developer to redesign the site. Um, there's more to say, but I'll, I'll stop for now. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, Rochelle has a great question and I'll, I'll expand it a little bit and say, when you did your redesigns, uh, what, what things did you user test and did you do that in-house or did you contract that out as, as to another organization to help or another entity to help with user testing? I can go first. Um, we did not contract that out. We, we, like I said, we had this, we, we called it a website improvement program. So right on the website, it said, join us. And we had people sign up and we did a couple, I mean, we did like, sometimes we gave people a scenario. Like if you re received an eviction notice and here's this website, somebody told you to go visit this website, what what would you do to find help? And then we would re record them doing it and ask them to, um, it's it's called like thinking aloud, kind of like I'm, I'm thinking I should click on this, but I'm not sure, let me try it. Oh, that didn't work. And then we would took, took all of the, those conversations that we had and we dropped them into a program called Dovetail and dovetails for usability testing. It lets you take all of like these conversations and see where people are getting frustrated and tag that as like a frustration point or tag it as like easy to find or tag it as like, I'm, I'm wishing there was something else here or, oh, I like that there's a video and we tag it. And so you're able to see patterns that in that way, we have a ton of qualitative data that we gathered through that program that honestly we haven't even had the capacity to stand to do deeper analysis. And we're hoping to work with the web developer that we're going to hire to do another level of what do we, what's working and what's not. Um, I think we had, we had practice at doing stuff like this because we had received a technology initiative grant in 2016 to do usability testing of videos because we had been making YouTube videos and, you know, people would ask, a lot of times like skeptical lawyers would ask, do these videos actually help people? And honestly, we just didn't really have like any evidence. I mean, we don't know. People would anecdotally say, oh, I like that video. I, you made it really clear, you know, how to ask for repairs from my landlord kind of thing, or what to do if you get sued by a collection agency. But we actually went out into the community and did usability testing sessions. So facilitated a discussion. We learned a lot about how to do this from an organization in British Columbia. And so short answer is we did it in-house. And um, and like I said, we did other things called listening sessions. And that's more just like getting in a, a Zoom and having people tell us about their experience with the site, like with like librarians, for example. And we learned things like, uh, like in certain libraries, like they are, <laughs> they've pre-printed out this sort of like Washington law help, like here's where to find stuff. And then they'll write in like when people come in and they need papers for like a parenting plan, they'll write in, here's what to look for. And we, we were, that, that led us to the, the idea that like, oh, maybe we should create those for people, that sort of print resource or something, or maybe it should be a, a, a print here kind of thing. So that's, 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 short <laughs> version of the major efforts we've made. So I'll stop. I can go next. Um, we've done a lot of user testing over 
all of our iterations and it's it's varied depending on when and where when and what we were testing um for the last several years we've done quite a bit of user testing um, using usability hub um, sometimes with our own panel sometimes we will pay for their panels uh, because we can get results back really quickly but it tends to be more of first click tests and um where you know first click um design preferences those kind of of, of tests we also did a because we completely rechanged the site architecture in our 2016 rebuild, we did a lot of um, card sort and tree navigation tests online. We also do observation tests. We do it now more over Zoom than in person, but we did do some in person. We had staff that would go out and stand on the street corner of Chicago and stop people and ask them to do a quick user test on paper and give them a, a gift card. And, and that worked pretty well for us. And we do it at different points in the process. Sometimes we'll do it when we have an ugly paper prototype. Sometimes we'll do it when we have a polished design that hasn't been implemented. And then sometimes we'll do it once the it's been implemented and it's on the website. And I'll talk briefly. Um, we did, when we were actually doing our redesign, there was some user testing that was built into that and our we worked with an outside firm who did all of the technology work on the site um, and they did they ran the actual testing but we were responsible for coming up with scenarios and finding the people to show up um, and just in total honesty i think for us sometimes it's been really hard to find people and to get people to show up i feel like when people talk about it like oftentimes i feel like oh like you guys seem to have no problem getting people and we often struggle to get people to show up for user testing um, so i don't have any brilliant uh, advice on that. Um, but we've offered gift cards and done a variety of things. Um, but we've usually done our user testing in partnership with somebody else. Um, when we've done some more recent user testing, we have done online um, through different, and I wasn't in charge of that, so I can't remember the name of who we worked through to do um, sort of some of the online usability. It was related to accessibility testing. Um, but that's been somewhat more successful, but we don't do, um, I would say super consistent in-house user testing. It's something that we do in, when we're doing specific projects or rolling something specific out. Um, and it's something that I think we've honestly struggled with sometimes to do. And so we rely also on looking at Google analytics data, on looking at, search terms on getting feedback from our partners and other users. Um, we have also worked with librarians and other sort of trusted intermediaries. And we did some focused testing with them when we were rolling out our redesign where we had small groups of folks come in and navigate the website and answer questions and give us their thoughts just in a interview. And that's something that um, we had a consultant through a separately funded project who helped us with that. Um, but we, again, were responsible for finding the partners and for coming up with the scenarios. And then um, the consultant helped with sort of structuring that and managing the feedback. And that was um, super helpful because it gives you, of course, a sense of what these power users are asking questions about and also things that um, seemed obvious to us. But like a social worker was like, I don't understand why I didn't just get a list of lawyers out of this. And we're like, why did you think you were going to get a list of lawyers out of this? But that's still really useful information to have. So that's kind of what we've done um, or not done for user testing. I'll yeah. just add, I'll add one more thing because Michigan Legal Help, we're um, in the middle of our own Michigan Legal Help 2.0 project. And one thing that we did that was really helpful was we got a usability audit from the Graphic Advocacy Project. Um, and they put together a whole report and slideshow of like, you know, suggestions that they had for new layouts or, you know, ways that usability and accessibility could be improved. And like having that document to give to our developers was really, really helpful. So on this, on the topic of sort of, you know, you're, you're doing usability testing because you're doing a redesign. Can you talk about some of the major changes to design or architecture or functionality that you made um, during these transitions? 
I can start. Um, we, so the biggest change that we made when we made the shift was we had not had any sort of triage. What we had prior to our shift was a library with a lot of resources. And as Daniel was talking about, like we had resources that we probably didn't even know were in there. Um, and then we had sort of an organization list where folks could search a static sort of phone book style um, directory of what legal service providers were in existence. And the biggest thing that we did was to smush those things together into a Q&A format into a triage system that we built um, that would, and we relied a lot on looking at what other folks had done. So like looking at how Illinois was working, looking at how Michigan's was working, looking at Connecticut and um, Pine Tree, I believe also at the time, and seeing like how did how were questions structured and like one of the decisions we made is that in our system you the first thing that you got were resources and then you could answer questions about your income and location to get a referral but we sort of one concrete decision we made was to separate that differently than what we had seen done so far but then it also meant that our some of our logic flow and other things had to shift um, one thing I should mention about Minnesota that may or may not be unique, but we have seven, um, six legal services like LSC or legal services legacy projects. And then we have um, probably 12 other legal services organizations and they're all independent um, entities. But so we don't have a single program that we refer to. We have all of these different programs that we are trying to work with and coordinate referrals to. And so part of what was involved for us was also just like making sure that we had good info because the other thing we were shifting was from a um, single point of control is that we wanted to make it possible for organizations to edit and control their own listings. So that if um, our the office that's located in St. Cloud, Minnesota got a grant to do crime victims work that they could um, add that information to their own listing and update the types of cases they were taking. Or that they could say, uh, we are, our office in Grand Rapids just lost the only family law attorney, so we are closing intake on family law for right now. And part of what we wanted was to have that information about um, like what services organizations were actually providing more up to date than it ever had been because we knew that that had been really static. And so we have a way in for the organizations to edit their own listings so that that helps with that referral and intake process. And so that was the other piece we were adding that was um, unique and different from what we had had before. And now we've added to that to have like our staff directory, which is only available to legal aid staff, but our staff directory lives on our site now too, because it's based on a lot of the same information. Um, so hopefully that's kind of a useful um, bit. And I'll, I know there was a question in the chat and I'll just answer that and I'll hand things off to Gwen or Daniel. So in, in terms of Illinois, I, I think our biggest, I mean, our, our biggest really was going from cold fusion to Drupal 7, and then from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, because everything had to be completely rewritten from scratch. Um, we have never been on like the pro bono net template or, or another template. We've always rolled our own. And which meant I wrote every line of code in the, in the cold fusion website and that had to be transferred into Drupal 7. And while there was a lot that we could do off the shelf, there was still a whole lot of stuff that had to be custom built. We ended up when we launched, I think we had about 50 to 60 custom modules in Drupal 7. When we went from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, all of those custom modules had to then be rewritten into Drupal 8. And we had to do a whole new front end because the templating language for Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 are completely different. Um, we also, made, um, when we went from Cold Fusion to, to Drupal 7, we also made the decision to rethink how we did all of our legal content. Um, and so we created new content models and then we had to migrate all of that content over. And similarly, we had to re rebuild our, our, our online trio open intake system that at the time supported six organizations and now it's up to 12, which has also just gone through another major iteration there. 
um, that's not visible to most end users. So. And so I guess the question was, what changes did you make based on the testing? Or just generally, you know, what were some of the major shifts, yeah. major changes? And, and if you don't, I mean, I know that you're still very much in, in progress, uh, so you can take a pass at any time. <laughs> well, I mean, it, we, <laughs> yes, we are in the beginning of the process. And of the web developers, whoever we go with, the there is going to be another like discovery or analysis phase at the beginning of the design process where they're probably going to help us analyze what we've already collected and then also do more or that's what the, the companies have told us so we'll be finding out more but i like i think certain little things were confirmed like things that we suspected like there's two channels we call them in in this platform that we're on right now like you have a know your rights tab and then right next to it is this tab that says court forms and procedure and like people don't see that very well and they don't click on it you know they're just like if it's not here then there it doesn't seem entirely intuitive like well then i'll go over here you know what i mean mm -hmm. and so you know duly noted that's a change we could make in the in the new new site, you know. Um, there was another thing that there was just this like sort of like it, the way the table of contents thing, and we it was this module that we couldn't change, and it was like if we were linking to an external link, but there there wasn't much on the page, it would like have the table of contents. It would say go to link, and then the link would be there, so people would click on go to link, the page would move a little bit. <laughs> And they would assume that the link was broken. And we actually told Pro Bono Net about that. And they changed it. Because <laughs> we saw from the inventory, too, that like, wow, people are landing on this page through Google search. Like Gwen noted, most people come into the site, not from the home page, but through searching for eviction Washington state or something like that. And they'll come on to a resource. and. Um, but we saw them coming to those pages where we were linking to like, I don't know, the US bankruptcy court and then not clicking out. Like they would just get there and not. So anyways, that's that's improved. Um, but yeah, we, we've, there's other things that we'd like to have more obvious or easier to understand. Like, you know, if you get to that thing that's adjacent to what you actually are looking for, we want to make it more, easy to know like what's what are the realms of things that are over here you know because right now it's there's a lot of like it's still a little bit feels more like that brochure rack and if you don't know exactly what you're looking for and you get to something right next to it you might just leave and I, we've no we've been looking at all the other sites and one thing I, I noticed about West Virginia's site is like I love how and you can you look at the phone and there's like all these different topics like eviction, housing subsidy, you know, and you can click on more than one and it'll just filter <laughs> and kind of narrow it down in that way. And it's, it's, it's a good, we've noted that that's like something maybe we want to have. Um, we were looking at other sites. We didn't have an accessibility tool, like a, a thing. We have it now where you can change the the font, the text size, you can, you know, do reverse contrast. And we didn't have that. And it, it seems like, oh, well, an obvious improvement. But it is something that we have changed after noting, like, oh, they have that. We should have that <laughs> because that, that'll make the site more accessible. It's, and it's called user way. So if you go to Washington Law Help, you can click on this and change how the information is presented. Great, thank you. Um, I would love to hear from each of you um, an interesting challenge or unexpected issue that you faced um, pre-launch. So, in doing the work, um, you know, some something unexpected that happened and how you handled it or resolved it, or what you learned from it. Oh, I, 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 yes, I, I could go. Um, when we did the cultivation to. Um, Drupal 7, 
re rebuild. Um, and I did a session at, at one of the LSC conferences a few years, uh, uh, shortly after that called How Not to Build a Website. Um, it, it was, took twice as long as we expected it to take. Um, the, almost burned out the entire staff and um, cost twice what we expected it to cost. I think we were somewhere in this around $750,000 for the redesign rebuild. Um, in terms of staff costs and time and developer costs, because at the time I was doing most of the development work, but we did bring in some, some additional developers to work on it. Um, one of the most important things that came out of that process is I no longer do development work. Um, we've actually, I, I, I'm, I, I don't scale up enough. Um, and so we've outsourced all of our development work um, to a development company out in India. And we have three full-time developers who continue to work on the site year round. Um, because probably the most important thing to know when you're rebuilding a website is you're not done when it launches. Um, there's always something else to do. So. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think just um, kind of, we were building out a triage guide, but um, our developer had never done exactly that before. And so working with some of the, they had outside contractor helping with a part of it. Um, and I think just, it, it turned out okay. Um, but a lot of the communication between, um, we had a couple of staff members who really didn't have any technology background, which is fine. Um, I don't really have a huge technology background, but um, we sometimes spent a little bit too much time in meetings with the developer, um, trying to get everybody onto the same page. And that ate up a lot of time and resources that we probably didn't really need to be spending that way. And so I think making sure that you have the right staff people in the right positions who are you know, making decisions and having everyone on the same page about things, but not um, getting bogged down in sort of don't get stuck, <laughs> I guess I would say, because um, it's easy to have that happen. And you want people to understand what's happening, but also know who really needs to know and what they need to know and when um, so that you can keep the project moving forward. Um, and that I think just continually having the person though who did have really great tech skills and ability to communicate that making them the point person with the developer on some of those sort of more tricky um, pieces where we were trying to explain what the needs were for example in our triage guide um, and making sure that the developer really understood um, and making sure that we were reviewing those prototypes and going oops this is not what we thought we were getting um, and making sure that that feedback cycle is quick so that you can continue to like stay on task and stay on time. Cause we actually um, pretty much came in where we thought we would time-wise, um, but it was a little bit of a struggle to get there. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, now that we're in the pre phase, I, um, I don't know if it's a challenge. I guess it is a challenge, but it's been, it's been a, an education for me in, what is a content management system? And what's the difference between a headless content management system and, or a disconnected or uncoupled one? Those are terms that like maybe I've heard in my life, but like, I don't know, I was focusing on trying to do legal education stuff and I didn't pay that much attention or apparently, but, but in fact, it's a necessary component of a, a website library this vast is like, and it's like it, it, we're you know we, you ha you have a CMS content management system whether you know it or not it just <laughs> is it the most efficient way that you could be doing all of this like we you know we pass along word documents with track changes to you know volunteer attorneys and then give them to our we have two coordinators and then it gets formatted into a PDF and it gets put up on the HTML and there's this thirty step checklist about how things flow but right now it's kind of at that spreadsheet level and we're just like okay which ones is, who's working on this one and we want to move to a, a different kind of system and that's been a big part it's it's really like to, to improve our capacity of of our public legal education attorneys so we are able to respond more quickly when there's changes in the law or like when and 
make more timely items because right now it's just it's we have a we have a pretty it's it's not an efficient content management system or it's not as good as it could be and that's that's been a big challenge that we're going to be working through with the web developers who all have their own preferred ways of doing that like we've learned about different products and and solutions to that and we're going to be working on that but that's just a, a big thing a big part of a redesign project that i wasn't totally aware of last year and now i'm like okay now i really i'm excited to get this new cms so i can so like when something changes like the amount that you can sue for in small claims court or like an eligibility guideline and it's like it's it, it needs to be changed in like a hundred different places and right now it's it feels like we have to manually go in take the thing down put it back up okay which one is it is it over here and i want to be able to like make a change <laughs> to this one type of micro content whatever it is somebody's phone number an organization's phone number and i wanted to just ripple across and i'm hoping <laughs> we move to a, a cms that's more like that so yeah. I just through your through your comments, um, it sounds like, uh, with the exception of Ileo's cold fusion to Drupal transition, everyone has hired, has outsourced the bulk of the development work. Is that true? Or planning to hire, planning to outsource? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to just sort of make that point because I think in Michigan is all, Michigan Legal Help has also is also done the same has also done the same thing both the graphic design and the development work because none of us are designers <laughs> and you know while we technically have people who can do some of the development we don't have the time we don't have the scale that we need for these types of projects and Gwen um, I see your comment thank you very much we've already been learning from you <laughs> because of you the the way you've publicly al or allowed the public to view like the, how you have different types of content and i you know when I, I the word is so vague i just like it's one of those words that my brain just what are you saying content like <laughs> it just seems like it's everything but but okay we're talking a title oh that's right every resource has a title and then a number and then a difficulty of the legal problem might be a, another type of content, whether it's a legal problem or a legal solution, whether there's an organization that's available, you know, all of those are different little types of content and to, having to identify what you already have, we're, we're right in the middle of that process. So it was great to hear about unexpected issues and challenges uh, pre-launch, and, and I guess this is mostly for Gwen and Emily. Um, what about post-launch? What were some of the big lessons there? <laughs> um, we didn't realize exactly how hard we were going to be hit by bots the first couple of days of the, of the sites going live. Um, Google sees, oh, you've got all these new pages. We're going to hit rapid fire, hit the website, and um, you know, re-index your site and Bing's doing the same thing. And so we had a lot of performance problems the first couple of days. Um, luckily our developers were able to go in and um, do a few things under the hood to better manage some of that. But it, we had, a, a, our first couple of days were kind of painful. Um, we also had a lot of redirects, having to redirect the old website URLs to the new website URLs um, and hoping things didn't get lost. Um, and we thought we would, we thought we had done it all right in Drupal and then it turns out, nope, didn't, it didn't work that way. You have to actually go in and edit um, the raw HT access file on the server to actually do the redirects before it hits Drupal. And um, that was, a, a, I think, a big challenge. Um, I also highly recommend um, cake and champagne um, for every website launch with the whole staff. Yeah, I think I would agree that like food is a good, <laughs> it's a good reward. And um, fortunately, we didn't have sort of those technology glitches in the same way. Um, but I think we expected, and this actually come up in a question about like triage. I think we thought triage was going to get a lot more use than it did and has. 
Um, and so I think there was both excitement, um, this may be a little more existential, but like, I think there was excitement about the amount of time, energy, and effort that had been put into that. And then it was kind of like, what are we not doing right? Or what is the site not doing right? That these numbers are not higher than they are. Um, and that is something also where we've just, that's a nice thing about being able to continue to make tweaks and changes is that um, part of having that control over our site is being able to devote time, money, and resources to saying, okay, let's try this as a way and also building out our Google Analytics to be able to track what's happening through each of those pathways. Um, so, and as part of the re visiting things continually, um, but also that continual, what you think is continual improvement um, just takes kind of what Danny was saying about content, like how much content there is and just how much time it takes to um, like get that stuff up and going. And that for us, like how much time it takes to revisit our triage questions and review those um, means that it really is only gonna happen once or twice a year. Um, because it's a massive staff time undertaking when we do that. Um, and similarly, our, we've always had sort of a content management system because we've had this group of fact sheets that predated the website existing, which is great. But like the amount of time that takes, and we have them all in multiple languages. And um, I think as we've built out our language resources, that's been great. But the amount of additional time it takes to keep things up to date as you're talking about. Um, if we change wording in something or something changes in the law, there's um, three other languages in addition to English that we need to go make sure that that's been updated in. And I think just for us, I think continuing to be really honest that everything is gonna take um, more time than you probably think it will or should, even if you're good at it. How did you handle PR about the new site? with launch? Did you do like a soft launch and then do PR? Did you do it all at once? I'm covering my eyes because um, we've, we've done it both ways. Um, the soft launch is much better because when you do a press release and it's live and then you suddenly get hit with all this bot traffic, it's really unpleasant. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend doing um, a soft launch and then doing the announcement to everybody. Um, that's, um, also what we did. And a lot of our partners knew, like our legal aid partners knew it was launching, but yeah, we didn't do a, a push. Um, and we just reached out to sort of local media. Um, one really sort of funny one that we had is we were in like the, I think it was Minnesota doctors magazine or something as part of like healthcare legal partnerships. And they had us do, it was actually super cool. We did a whole like tear out in that magazine um, that then doctors could like put up on their wall that was like, here's how you can use um, this site when your clients are coming in with questions. Um, so that was like, I think some of those sort of surprising um, non-legal networks were helpful. Um, and then we leveraged like a lot of our legal aid and other partners to say, hey, make sure you're telling people that we have this and, um, just sending out a lot of materials when we relaunched too. Great. Did you come across any um, tools during your redesign efforts that were particularly helpful, like, um, you know, case management tools or, you know, anything? I feel like, you know, Daniel mentioned the, the accessibility tool. Do you have any recommendations for, for tools that were useful in planning or executing this process? For us, we, we relied and still rely very heavily on JIRA. Um, it, if you're not familiar with it, it's a product that is really was designed for software developers um, and it allows us to create agile backlog stories tickets um, and then communicate the acceptance criteria and move things across a development process. Um, and that's something that I still use every every day with my development team. Um, and I think I said thank you, Gwen. I think I said case management systems. I do mean I do mean project management systems. <laughs> yeah. 
Daniel put a link in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's dovetail. That's what we use to gather the qualitative conversation kind of data and to be able to tag it to see patterns. The project management system that we moved to, we were at, we were, were using something called Basecamp, and we moved to Smartsheet. And I like Smartsheet a little better because you know we've got it. First off, we have a I guess I call it a spreadsheet with like 1100 items on it and all of these different columns. And, you know, we have, well, currently we have five public legal education attorneys. So every one of those resources is assigned to one of those attorneys who's the primary editor. And we're actually going to be losing two of them. <laughs> so we just recently had to slide all, all the, the, cards because you can switch from grid to card view and you can also do gantt view and calendar if there's dates involved and i we really like that feature and in the card view it's easy for me to see oh all of these are in your bucket okay well we need to reassign them over here and it was like visually and the way it's used is it has more function than we were getting in with um with base camp so it's called smart sheet and then you can connect the sheets. So like you can have, that's the, everything's based on this major one. But then like if somebody, we can make a to-do list for like one of the coordinators by once, once their name gets assigned to it or tagged in it, then it shows up on their task list or to-do list. I, I, this, if we're just doing like software roundup, <laughs> the, the other one that we've recently got and not, not quite through, as part of the redesign, but maybe we started doing webinars and we needed to make transcripts. We really, we needed to make caption files, but to do that, it's a similar process. And so we, we got a program called Trint, T-R-I-N-T. And you can take the video file, like of a recording, and you just drag and drop it into this interface. And within seconds or minutes, it will generate a transcript and it will recognize different voices. And so you can go in and say, oh, that was Daniel. And it'll like ripple and try to write. It's not perfect. You do have to have somebody go in and, you know, tell it, but you can remove the ums and the ahs. <laughs> you can capitalize Washington Law Help and then it'll like, oh, okay, do it throughout. And it also ge generate a caption file. So that's good for, I mean, that's what you need for accessible videos. So we, we've been using that a lot. And yeah, I'm also- a couple other... Oh, sorry, you can go. <laughs> a couple other things that, that we use. Um, we use a product called Axure, A-X-U-R-E, um, for doing rapid prototyping um, because it lets me do drag and drop um, widgets on a page and I can sort of mock pages up before I have to put them in front of a designer to make them you know, pretty and give me something to test off of. Um, we also, if you install the developer plugin for Chrome, there's a tool called Lighthouse that will allow you to do um, performance and accessibility audits on a, on a web page, and it's free. Um, and it will give you at least an overview of how, how your page is doing. There was a question in the chat. Oh, sorry, Emily, did you want to? Did you want to? No, I was just going to answer the question in the chat. <laughs> okay, so I, I'll, I'll I'll put it up to everyone. Um, uh, the question is about what kind of staffing you had. I guess this is in house because the you know you all have hired uh, outside developers. What kind of staffing in house did you have? And then, if anyone has um, you know a budget for the the you know the the process of creating the new website and Rochelle points out, we know that the costs don't stop there, but like for this phase, the redevelopment phase. Um, so staffing and costs. So if you staffing have for us, um, at the time that we started the redesign, I think we were a staff of, sorry, our staffing has changed a lot. Um, and because of COVID, I'm like, who was on maternity leave when? Um, <laughs> five, I think we had five in-house staff members three of whom I would say, um, Jay Singleton, who a lot of people know me, and then our um, sort of office um, director, um, who we went through a shift in that right at the beginning of the project, which was hard. Um, I'll say that. 
Um, but so the three of us really sort of were in charge of everything. We had um, the other staff members, actually six total, I should say. The other staff members got pulled in to things like as needed, like when we were migrating content, that was sort of an all hands on deck. Everybody helps upload um, resources and add resources onto the new platform because there was not a really easy way for us to move things over from the Provana Net platform to our Drupal platform. Um, but so that's, um, I would say three staff members who were pretty much, we did have other things we were doing at the time, but not a whole lot. Um, the redesign was the biggest piece. I'll just say that the firm, the development firm we worked with was a pretty small shop. So um, lest you think that there's some sort of behemoth, um, we had, you know, they're a four or five person shop total, including like the designer and everything else. And then cost-wise, I just um, pulled up one of our budget sheets to see it. And it looks like we were right around 250. Um, and I, that doesn't include, but I'm pretty sure we got some in-kind hours donated from our development firm, if I'm correctly recalling. Um, so that's at least sort of a snapshot. And like I said, that doesn't include the maintenance or anything like that. I don't really want to answer this. Um, so, I mean, Alejo is, <laughs> I mean, you know, Alejo has always been very fortunate um, to be well-funded and well-staffed. Um, and I don't know what our, what our budget for, what we, our actual expenditure was for this last redesign. I can tell you that my maintenance, that my annual maintenance budget for the website, for the developers is about 270,000 a year. Um, which is about 12 or 13% of Aleo's budget. Um, and we have four full-time content members and um, a product support manager who is just doing UX, um, a, an online triage and intake system product manager. Um, and then I'm still doing about half of my, probably maybe half of my time managing the developers. Um, and we have three full-time software engineers that we have on, on contract and a half-time um, quality assurance analyst and the, a, a 10 hour a week product manager, pro, pro, project manager of the development team. So, so I don't want to answer that. Um, like I said, Alea has been very fortunate. Yeah, our team has expanded and then now it's kind of contracting, but in, and during COVID it did this. So like we have a website manager, Danielle Rebar, who has been maintaining Washington Law Help and also nwjustice.org and our staff internet for 25 years. And she does the work of probably three people. I don't know, <laughs> it's like, and uh, we have two coordinators. So they do administrative assistance and we we had we had one at first in during the pandemic and then we've gotten another full-time coordinators and then the attorneys we have one attorney who is, is just project manages washington forms online that's our interactive interviews and then we've gone from from let's say point 4 cuz i was i was like a part-time working on washington law help making videos when i was also working as a staff attorney on our, on our statewide hotline. And I did that for many years. Then I became full-time part of the team. And then we were able to, uh, Washington State provided temporary legal assistance money through COVID or in response to COVID. And so we were able to get two more full-time attorneys and they were specific, like one was focused on language access, one focused on eviction and housing and, um, now we're going to be at three, three of those attorneys, including me. So what, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The Washington Law Help team is a team of seven. Um, we don't have a developer, so we're going to have to rely on the developers. And um, our budget remains to be seen, but I can tell you what we put in our RFP, which I'll drop a link to the RFP. We should probably, it's still up on the website. Um, 
we've gotten several good proposals, but that's just an example. But that was a whole challenge and a process in and of itself is to write that RFP. And we learned a lot by meeting with Illinois Legal Aid Online and Law Help Minnesota and Michigan Legal Help. So, um, but it's based on a federal, an application for a federal grant. It's a TIG grant. So that that the budget that we put out there is 100 to 150. So that's the range. And we know there's going to be ongoing maintenance costs and we will see how much it ends up. <laughs> All right, thank you all. We are close to the top of the hour. So if any of you have like one, one really important tip that you would pass on to anyone in this position, uh, what would that be? The one tip that I read actually in a design um, about design generally, which is that in any system, there's a fixed amount of complexity and you just get to decide who has that complexity. And sometimes like if you're trying to save money, um, that may mean that the user has a little more complexity because spending the money to reduce that complexity is going to be bananas. Um, or it might mean that that complexity goes to your staff who's going to maintain the thing. But that's, that was super helpful to me as a decision-making framework is that there's a set amount of complexity and you just have to decide who's dealing with it. That's great. And for me, I, I would say the most important thing is to make sure that you're also take, that you're taking care of yourself while you're going through these redesigns because it's a huge amount of stress. Um, my content team will also tell you to remember that they're users too. Um, and that what you do in terms of configuring your content management system and backend tools and reporting affects them more than it's gonna affect anybody else. And they're the, they are your heaviest users of the system. So kind of keep them in mind. Great. I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I have any big hot tips yet, but <laughs> we'll come back to you in a year for your yeah, come tip. back in a year. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Gwen, Emily, and Daniel so much. This was a great conversation. Um, and I appreciate everyone who's on the call for coming to listen and, and add questions and things. Um, the summer self-help series continues uh, next week, uh, July 14th. We'll be talking about user-centered design and self-help websites with um, Ashley Trenny from the Graphic Advocacy Project. So um, it's a great series that Ladirja put together and uh, I'm looking forward to, to hearing more next week. So thank you all so much. and. Have a great rest of your week and weekend. Thank you.